I will just say that the vast majority of, of what I'll talk about and what I show is stuff that I've learned of other people. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not up here saying this it works for everyone. It's, it works for us. Um, so hopefully there'll be something you can take, for, uh, take from it. Uh, and pretty much everything I've done up here is, is, is what I've copied from other people and, and learned from them. Um, so that's feedlot in America. Some of you might have seen this picture before. Um, but you can see the mountains in the background. Um, that's not actually a mountain, that's a, that's a pile of cattle manure. And, uh, and so you can see the steam coming off the top there is actually smoke, and that, that pile of cow manure was on fire uh, for two years, uh, so they couldn't put it out. And I think the point really is just to make that cattle farming at the moment in the press uh, is in a lot, you know, is getting a lot of bad news about it, but I think a lot of the figures on the carbon emissions and all that sort of stuff come from these kinds of systems. And the reality is that in the UK and Ireland, we don't have these kinds of systems that are this environmentally degrading. Um, and I think, you know, another example of, you know, and so maybe some criticism of the industry is justified and we, we shouldn't defend everything. And maybe we could do better. Uh, and Lord knows we need, um, we need some good news in the industry at the moment. Um, so that's on one of the farms we rent. There's a, that was a bunch of fattening cattle four or five years ago. Um, and we, you can see we're grazing through uh, using the electric fences to, to strip graze. You can see we're leaving quite a lot behind. And also we're grazing right through the flowering period, which lots of ecologists tell you can't do because you get rid of the flowers. But as long as you manage it, and it's managed grazing rather than um, constant grazing, we've actually managed to increase diversity, as we'll show you hopefully in the, in the presentation as we go on. A key, another key thing about what we're doing with the grasslands is, is people often talk in ecology or you listen to Friends of the Earth or whoever, and everyone's talking about trees. And there's a, there's a great move with agroforestry and silver pasture, which is great, but everyone's always talking about trees. And we forget about the importance of natural grasslands, native grasslands. They make up such a huge part of our... Our earth that isn't under the ocean and uh, you know these have been managed by large herbivores um, for millennia and, and we've got to remember that that the, the value in the ecology is also in the grasslands and not just in in the in the treescapes um, I love that quote there I'll let you read it um, but I just find it really interesting you think about some of the early settlers in North America and they talk about these herds of, of, of buffalo taking two weeks to go by and uh, a million heads strong and you think about the animal impact on the soil that would have been in those situations you know if, if there's a weather event or whatever that number of animals moving across a landscape is just going to be huge and I think it's another interesting thing and quite a hopeful thing is you hear Joel Salatin talking about you know early settlers going into the grasslands and being able to tie the grass in a knot over the saddle and the productivity that there was in those grasslands that were managed, um, you know, just by natural processes. And the tonnage of herbivores, if we look at the fossil record, the tonnage of herbivores in North America uh, today, even with all the advancements that we've got in terms of growing maize and crops to increase the number of cattle we can feed, is lower than it was in prehistory, from what we understand of the fossil record. So actually, with all our technology and all our chemicals, we still haven't managed to beat the productivity of Mother Nature in those grassland ecosystems. And I think that's incredibly hopeful in terms of what we can do for food production and the potential that we have on our farms to produce good food. The other thing I'd say as well, we talk about that disturbance that all of those animals would, would give. So how come the prairies and the, the grasslands, you, you know, how come they weren't just covered in weeds because of all that bare ground that was created? And I think the other thing to remember is in these natural grazing systems, where the plant gets to express its genetic potential to set seed. And the seed rates that you get, so you know, we try and do that on our grass, grasslands, the seed rates you get on these grasslands are going to be probably two or three times, if you were to plough that field and, and go and broadcast seed onto it, the natural seed drops probably two or three times that. So when you create bare ground and you create an opening, and if you've got a healthy soil that's bioactive, then this, the germination competition with the weed seeds is going to be enormous. Uh, and actually, they don't enjoy that competition, and they, and they don't like that. 
And I think that you know, that can give us a bit more confidence when we're starting out on these kinds of grazing systems that if you do a little bit of damage, it's not the end of the world as long as you're managing your grassland properly. So in terms of the mob grazing, you know, the natural systems, those animals that were the mobbed together by predators in different parts of the world, by different, different animals. And then through time, that changed. Um, you know, before we started building fences everywhere, um, we, we followed the, the herbivores in our, uh, you know, and when we moved across a landscape. And that applied rest so that those animals were moving, you know, seasonally grazing, and, and everything was getting grazed off and then the rest was being applied to those areas, and particularly in those arid lands. And this process obviously created more green, created more forage, and you know, when we talk about that tonnage of herbivores that was there in prehistory, supported a huge animal life as well. Um, and a lot of you will be aware of Alan Savory, and I think in terms of what we're talking about with carbon and, and, and climate change and, and the risks that we've got with all of that, it's incredibly hopeful what we can do with soil and I th in terms of carbon storage. And I think it's what's interesting at the moment is you can go to corporations at the moment and they'll pay you to plant trees. And we're all talking about soil carbon. But there's actually not a lot of people out there at the moment that you can go to and say, I will put this much carbon in my soil, will you pay me for that? And I think from a policy perspective, I think it's a really important thing that we need to try and push the soil argument and just keep banging on about soils. Um, because you know, some of the estimates that have been made, I think they're really conservative in terms of what, what's achievable. Like, we can solve this really quite easily um, with the potential of soil to store carbon. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, everything's bad news at the moment, isn't it? But hopefully that's a bit of, bit of good news. So in terms of the holistic management framework, um, but this is actually what's changed a lot of how we do business on the farm and... and it's everyone always wants to talk about the grazing systems and how you manage the grazing but the reality is for us that it is the whole picture and you can't just do a grazing system and Alan Savory's got a great line that every grazing system ever devised has failed and I think the point point of that is that the holistic management framework is, is a decision making framework that essentially is based upon the fact that whatever you try and do is going to have and decisions you make, they're going to have unintended consequences on you, on the environment, on your community, and that you have to assume that you're going to have, you know, that there is a wrong decision or there's an unintended consequences that you're going to have to manage. So you're going to have to replan. And that feedback, feedback loop at the moment, at the bottom, sorry, where you plan, you, know, you in, implement that plan, and you've got to monitor, and then you control the, the things you weren't expecting to happen. And that's really important in terms of looking at what's happening when you're doing your grazing plan. But also in terms of your, your holistic goal or your holistic context that you want to look at, that, that holistic um, word is not sort of some sort of yogurt weaving hippie idea. It's, it, it's based in scientific theory that comes from Jan Smuts's theory of holism, which is essentially the idea that the natural world is so complex that it's very, very difficult for science to make good decisions because we always go into silos and we reduce things and we try and reduce the variables and that leads us into having conclusions that are not applicable when we bring that back into the whole world and these other holes within holes that we operate within. And in terms of managing our businesses, the key things of, of part of those holes are not just the ecosystems, or that's very important. It's not just the financials, which are very important. It's not just the, commu the local community, but also yourself and your family. So, you know, we can grow our businesses, but we can possibly get to a point where there's a lot of stress on family life. And, you know, if, if, if the marriage breaks down or, you know, there's a, you know, I don't want to bring it down, but there's, there's a big problem in the industry with, um, with uh, people taking their own lives um, uh, with the state, of the state of the industry at the moment. It's a serious thing. And I think we need to plan our businesses around, you know, if people just working harder is not an answer. Um, and the stresses involved on families and people um, is huge. And I, and I really recommend digging into, into this sort of framework to try and to, to look at how you can make sure you plan for these kinds of things when they happen in, in your businesses. In terms of what can be achieved, this is one of my favorite photos. This is one that Alan Savory uses, and this is in the Karoo. And the side on the left, has got, I believe, four times the amount of livestock to the side on the right. 
It's exactly the same climate, but if you look at the difference between the two sides and think about the side with the grass, a rain event, what's the difference in terms of infiltration rate from one side of the fence to the other? Um, how much moisture is going to be held on one side compared to the other? Are there going to be springs and ponds that actually manage to, to stay longer? Uh, but think about that over a landscape, a huge landscape scale. That's going to have a climate impact as well in terms of transpiration. It's going to have climate impact in terms of just radiative heat reflecting off that mud earth and the soil that's going to wash away from a rain event. And uh, it's really interesting to do a few of these talks. And I always find it's a lot easier doing them further away from home than on your doorstep. And... Um, Someone once said we did an event and someone put their hand up and said they, they wondered if that was a rainproof fence. And then someone else put their hand up and said, no, it's an idea-proof fence, which I thought was really good. <laughs> In terms of the grassland management, that for me, um, Andre Vaudin's Grass Productivity, is, that's what, uh, that was the first book that I started rotationally grazing, but this is what sort of led me into the holistic management because Alan Savory had written the foreword to the reprint of that book. And for our climate, I think Grass Productivity is probably the best book you can buy. It doesn't just talk about organic management, it also talks about the use of synthetic fertilizers, the positives and negatives, and the impact of those. But that, and I think Andre Vaudin did incredible work on, on that, and it's all in that book and some of his other publications. But that's the key thing for me, is, I'll let you read the quote, but, but essentially, the grass plant and the forage plant has evolved with a grazing animal. And so as soon as it's, it's almost preparing itself to be grazed, and in order to do that, it's used photosynthesis to store energy in the roots of, and crown of that plant. And so when it gets grazed off, it then uses the energy that's stored in the roots of crown to regrow. Now, if we, in a natural grazing system, a rest is applied, you've got nomadic species moving, seasonally grazing, applying rest. But if we come back and graze that plant before it's had a chance to put the energy back in the roots and crown again, it's not going to regrow. And that's when we have to go and phone up ICI or whoever and start feeding those grass plants in order to make them grow. And I think that's where we differ perhaps on some of the three-leaf grazing systems, where we're trying to, whilst those are very productive, um, with the additional nutrients they require in order to operate. By working with the plant rather than against it, it allows us to cut those inputs out of our production systems. And if we go in and regraze that plant before it's had a chance to put its, the energy stores back in, the research shows that you've got about an additional 18 to 21 days before it reaches the, the same level of growth where you can go in and regraze. So it has a huge impact on your rotation and, as well and, and the timings of, and when things are ready to, uh, ready to grow. Because the key thing is as soon as it uses that energy and sticks out that leaf and it's got its solar panel out, then it can really start motoring and growth. But as soon as you interrupt that process, it sort of sets everything back. And then if we look at, you know, another good quote from Vozan is, you know, we've got the technology now. We might have moved things nomadically with, live, with, with horses and dogs in the past. But we've got electric fences, we've got the technology now where we can manage this. And if we look at the, the composition of the pasture that we use as well, diversity is absolutely key. And we've talked a little bit about that today and people asking about what species should you put in. We've got some herbal lays, but on the whole, what I try and do is look at our native flora. So um, Christine talking about looking in the ditch and seeing what's growing on the roadside is a good is a good thing to do, but also your old traditional hay meadows that I think your environmental schemes support. The species that you'll get in those, I mean, some of our old hay meadows have got 200 plus species um, that we've got in them, uh, that we're using the hay from. And of course, we can then use that to spread the seed and, and increase the diversity on the, on the extra farms we take on. But I think in terms of that diversity, it, it really just needs almost as many things as possible. Because when I come in to graze, if I think about the start of a grazing season and I'm coming in, the first thing that's coming through is meadow foxtail. And it's, without any fertilizer, meadow foxtail is easily, in, as an early season growth, easily as productive as any ryegrass that I've ever seen. The trouble with it is that it stops growing in about the middle of May. And then it doesn't grow again until the autumn. But that doesn't matter if you've got other species coming in 
at different times that are going to be growing in. Because after the meta foxtail, lets you go into sort of tall covers with a higher carbon content, so you're not so it's not running straight through the cows um, because it's at a, a later state of maturity, and it'll start heading sort of mid March. And you, so you've got this sort of more balanced ration. And I find when, if I move on to some of the paddocks we've got of ryegrass and the cows, it's just flying through them. You know, the forage analysis might show that it's quite good stuff, but it, the, the cows never seem happy on it compared to whether on the native forage. And once the meadow foxtail's gone through, you then start to get some of the other things. But it's interesting, one of the reasons that they chose ryegrass to create, uh, to use as a breeding plant, to then go on and add productivity to was because of the ease of harvesting the seed, not because of how productive it was at that time. And so something like meadow foxtail is a, a really clever plant because, as I said, it'll start heading in, in March, but it'll still be heading in, in middle of May and sometimes a little bit later. And then it ripens really variably across the, across the plant, across the field, but also ripens really variably on the head of the fo meadow foxtail tail as well which is great because it's dropping seed at lots of different times and it's giving itself the, the possibility of reseeding itself at lots of different times through that, through that process. But if you wanted to harvest seed from it and, and, and plant breed with it, it'd be an absolute nightmare. So it doesn't get chosen for that reason. And then following on from the meadow foxtail, you're gonna have your smooth stalk, uh, rough stalk meadow grass. They start to come in. Your cock's foot starts to come in. Um, and tall fescues are really good early season, late season grass. And, and also you've got different kinds of root systems. So those deep-rooted system plants like cock's foot, which is a mainstay of our production, and also tall fescue, whilst not the most palatable plant, huge deep tap roots on them that can really start transforming your soils and getting really good infiltration into the soil. Um, but then you need that balanced, you can have other deep-rooted herbs, so like your chicories have been talked about, your plantains, but then you also need your dense matted root systems as well. So things like um, yarrow, for example, has a, a pretty good tap root, but it's also got a nice mass of, of roots around. And I always find a mixture of yarrow and red fescue with those deeper rooting plants. Like red fescue is not going to grow you a lot of grass, but it holds cattle up fantastically well in the winter. That matted root to mix with the deep tap roots is what you want. So when you're thinking about these mixes and you're thinking about, rather than focus on which species do I want, can I have the perfect mix? Think about the different structures of roots and the different times of when things are growing and when they're maturing. And then that's gonna give you that, that growth that Christine was talking about, where those root exudates are coming out from different plants at different times right throughout the season and that diversity helps. And so things like your cock's foot can really help you in the middle of summer when everything else is starting to dry off and you're losing production. That's just an example there of, of what happens if you do regraze the plant. So if you go in and you graze it, but then you regraze it on the third picture along day five, it gets regrazed, then it loses. It has to shed root mass in order for it to regrow. But I've found from digging a lot of holes that just grazing it off doesn't mean it sheds roots because there's no reason for it to do so. It's got the energy to regrow. It's not a stressed plant, even when it's been grazed. So that's not a problem. But if you look at those pic that picture, I think it's just a good illustration of imagining the difference of cattle being held up in the winter with those different kinds of root masses. And particularly when you know, people come on the farm and say, oh, I can't, people come and say, I can't do this outwintering that you do because we're on, we're on heavy clay. And I say, well, we're on heavy clay. And then the next chap will come and say, oh, I can't do this outwintering because we're on sand. You can't outwinter on sand. And like, but the reality is, as Christine says, you can change your soil structure and it doesn't have to be difficult to manage. You can improve it. And all the organic matter you can add in, the better, the easier to manage it is. And actually, I find our best fields, we've moved from about 8 9% organic matter in the permanent pastures. And we're in a project with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And we're now... Uh, the best field, which is also the most diverse, is 16.8% organic matter. Um, and that's climbed from 14.7 uh, three years previously. And uh, the, the scientists from Centre of Ecology and Hydrology are just monitoring all these changes and the diversity and the difference between the, t the, the fields. But I find once you get over about 12% organic matter, it's actually really difficult to screw it up. It's really hard to poach it. You, you know, as long as you apply rest and you're not on there too long, it'll come back really well. And as long as there's been a seed drop, it's really hard to damage the soils. 
This is just an example to show about, you know, if we're grazing plants, we never let them get above three or four leaves, then as a rule, the, root, the, mass, the biomass below ground will be more or less equal to the biomass above ground. So if you don't let those plants reach the genetic potential, then the root systems won't reach the genetic potential either. And that for us is a big thing because the wintering cost is where we save on our beef enterprise. So we need that root mass really looked after. The other thing, if we look at, say, a, con a constant grazing system, is it's really selective. And so whilst that's the same plant there, that's just to demonstrate that if there's one plant that is not being grazed, it's having a whale of a time, there's absolutely no competition for it. That, I mean, that could be a dock or a thistle, it could be a rush uh, that's getting selectively not grazed. And it's going to pr produce loads of... Um, loads of viable seed because there's, there's hardly any stress on it um, and I think if you can particularly with those weed species if you can create competition in that deep root zone you end up the, the weed species really don't like it I think it changes the biology and probably the chemistry of the soil down there and that seed and I, I've just seen creeping thistles slowly just start to disappear same with docks uh, you know farm we recently took on 180 acres and we had 80 acres we from of arable land we reseeded down and the docks came in initially and they just slowly dissipate, but they come in, in to do a job. And then once the job's done and the soil's changed, it's not anaerobic, it's not bacterial soil, they don't seem to like it as much. Um, and just to remember that the forbs as well, when we're talking about our grazing, they're less resistant to grazing. So they're less adapted to respond to, to that constant, to that second, third bite. And so if we, if we, do, if we don't have a rotation, then we're gonna lose diversity um, and, and continuous grazing, particularly where we've got species-rich sites or wildlife sites, quite often you'll see continuous grazing and that, that is having an impact on diversity. And what it's probably doing is, whilst you might maintain it, but it's preventing an increase in diversity on these sites that are often managed by NGOs and conservationists like myself. The other thing is, is thinking about planning. Um, so if you're planning the your grazing, you can think about, for example, when you might be carving, so on your grazing rotation, where are you going to be? You want to be probably near the sheds or near, near your handling systems when you're carving, perhaps when you're weaning. You might want to think about if there's a conservation program in one of the areas, you're not going to be grazing that when, I don't know, when the butterflies are emerging or when the birds, bird nests are breeding. And so adding that in um, can be a really valuable thing uh, in terms of the ecology. And it helps us, you know, in terms of the messages we're giving out about the industry and what we're doing in farming, you know, if we can show the benefits and how we're thinking of the wildlife on our farms, you know, I think that's a really good thing. I think also looking at where the fencing is and where we've got existing water supply and how we can do that as cost effectively as possible. Um, you know, that's a chap called Tim May on the King's Clear estate. Um, just making mobile troughs. There's a metal plate bolted to the bottom of that tire that he can drag around with his, um, with his quad bike, and then they can just quick connectors uh, to different places in the field. He can stick that in, and it allows that back fence to keep moving with the cattle to make sure you're not regrazing re the, uh, the regrowing plant. That's just a, a quick look there of some of the stockpile uh, that we have. So we, we probably end up in the winter of going into somewhere in the region of 3,000 to 3,500 kilos of dry matter average across, uh, across the place. We don't measure all the time, but we do measure just before we go into the dormant season so we know how much forage we've got for our winter grazing. And then we'll, we'll supplement that with bales. Um, initially we didn't, we just did, we did, a, we did a few years without any hay, without any supplementation, just grazing through the winter. But obviously there are risks there in terms of severe wet weather or potentially if there's a long, long period of snow. Um, but the cattle did really well on it um, and, you know, and gained well uh, fattening cattle on that system. I think the other thing about it is the fact that they are moving all the time through that winter. While there'll be, while there'll be some deterioration in the quality of the forage, it will... Uh, it will be more or less the same. And you're giving them a, a daily bite or a, a bite every two days. Their, their daily bite of nutrition is more or less equal every day as you go through that winter. And the, and the difference that has to, say, giving them a, a bigger paddock for, say, a week or two um, is, is huge in terms of body condition and performance over winter. That makes such a huge difference because 
You know, as you know, the old saying that they eat with five mouths with all their feet as well. So they're trampling on it. So every day they're on that. If they're not moving on to fresh forage, then they're actually having an impact on the quality of the forage they're able to take. And you know what it's like. They go around the first day, take the best. Say, second day, take the second best. And by the fifth day, uh, they're not getting the same nutritional take as they had on day one. So that, just that through the winter really helps in terms of performance. And just so, you know, that was taken, the, the poor cow was taken on a nature reserve where they set stock right through the winter. And I think there's an element that we've got to think about body condition and we've got to think about welfare uh, in terms of what we're doing. And it's not probably not acceptable. The body condition difference on the two, two sets of cattle um, is there to see. Um, and then that's, you know, back to what we've got. You know, hugely diverse pastures, loads of, you can see a lot of oxide daisy in there, but there's a lot of knapweed. We've got a lot of the ranunculus, uh, the buttercups, um, loads of different legumes have started coming on in three kinds of vetches the the vetch tares as well we get three kinds of them bird's foot trefils a really good one and it works really well with the red clover that seems to come in on its own and if you've got some high legume quantities and you're worried about bloat that's where it's really good you know some of the species like the the plantain and the bird's foot trefil uh, we can't really grow samphoin, but those species are high in tannins, which automatically uh, uh, help if there's a, you know, a risk of bloat in a pasture. So just actually, if you have the diversity, a lot of, a lot of plants are high, or, or wildflowers are quite high in condensed tannins. And you might have heard about people using um, seaweed to feed cows to lower the methane emissions from the cows. Um, the reason why the seaweed works is because it's high in condensed tannins. But actually, our native pastures are full of species that are also high in condensed tannins, you know, just as, um, as tree species are as well. So actually, their natural diet has a, a, an ameliorating effect on that, on that methane that comes out. Just a few of the species that we've had come in. So a huge number of orchids coming in. We've got uh, common spotted orchids, pyramidal orchids, bee orchids just coming in all over. And interestingly as well, some of the saprozylic plants, like that, there's a broom rape there on the left-hand side in the middle, which is a, is a plant that doesn't photosynthesize. You, synthesize, you can see it's brown, but it lives on the dead material. And because we're trampling stuff in all the time, it, that's now got food. It's got that cellulose that's being broken down and that nutrient cycle is really starting to motor. And we're starting to get all these different plants coming in. And the productivity in this, I mean, where we've been doing this the longest, in midsummer now, we're going into covers. We try and keep ahead of it if we can, but it usually let it get, get ahead if we can. And we're going into covers, they're sort of with the stalks and the seed heads, they're up here, you know, chest height, I'm six foot two, and you just lose the cattle in them. And, th and that's changed over five, six, seven years, and you just get into this, you know, the pr productivity is huge. And when we trample that in, the regrowth is fantastic, um, and you know, just it'd be it's exciting for us to see where that can go. Really, here's some more orchids. So there's that's uh, green-winged orchids, um, different different starts of them. And an interesting thing we've done with those is, you know, just think about when I was a kid around the kitchen table, and we, all we heard was the it was BSE or the prices were terrible and all this sort of stuff. And you know, one of the things we do with the kids, we do an orchid count every year, and they can see that the number of the orchids are going up. So that's the sorts of things we're talking about, and these positive things that the farm's doing that they can see. And that's been really helpful, actually, to counter some of the stuff they're getting at school that, that farming's to blame for basically everything at the moment. Um, but they can see at home, that actually, no, there's loads of positive stuff going on. And they're all keen and they're interested. And, you know, it's one of the things that gets you up in the morning that you hope you're able to pass a business on to them if they're keen to take it on. Things uh, pepper saxifrage, burnet saxifrage, uh, drop wort in this picture. Um, uh, you know, real, not that common species that just seem to be popping up and arriving in the pastures, but they're also coming from some of the bale feeding we do, which I'll talk a little bit about later. The long grass over winter means we've got uh, short-eared owl come and roost in, in the pastures. Grey partridge have turned up and particularly like going in the bale grazing areas. Huge numbers of... Um, uh, voles mean we get predators, uh, like, obviously like the owls, but there's a great grey shrike there. And we had a cattle egret that's turned up a couple of time, a couple of years, and stayed for a couple of weeks as well. So it's interesting what diversity can bring. Within a couple of years, the barn owls we just had barn owls turned up. Within three years, we had three pairs of barn owls on each farm. There's so many voles. Like when when you go to move in the tall grass grazing, when you go to move the cattle, 
you can actually see, as the cattle move into the pasture, the voles hear them and they're all, they start scurrying through, you can see them. The kestrel turns up, takes three or four voles and goes and sits in the tree for the rest of the day, is fed, is happy. And actually, as I pull in with the truck to that farm, the kestrel just hops from tree to tree following me. To, no, he knows it's feeding time, so it's interesting. Uh, stone chats that are overwintering and the starlings as well, whilst I don't know what the situation with starlings is over here, I know some places it's a, they're a pest, but we're actually got to a situation in certain parts of the UK where they're, where they're getting rare. Um, and so, but you see them on the backs of the cattle and they're following the cattle and they're taking the dung invertebrates and, and then a couple of days after in the paddocks that we moved a few days ago, you see the pied wagtails and you see the, and the herons actually will quite often move in and, and they'll take voles and they'll, you know, they're not herbivores. Um, but, you know, it's just great to see all the wildlife it's brought back. But it isn't just about the wildlife side of things. It's also about performance of, on, on the business side. So we... It's really important to us that this system's allowed us to grow our business. Um, I would just add that these figures are um, from when prices for about 12 months ago. So the, these would be down now. So that net cap pro cash profit figure at the bottom of 300 with the, pro with the fall in the price is now probably just under, just under 200, so about 180. Um, we were working it out the other day and I haven't changed it on the slide yet. Um, but in terms of what we started off doing was finishing store cattle. So all the cattle finished off grass alone by 28 months. We're taking them at 12 to 15 months, running them through 12 months with daily moves. And even over winter outside with no hay, no feed, no supplement whatsoever, just grazing outside, they make an average of 0 0.8 kilos a day, including the winter throughout the whole, whole year. And so you know, at, the, at what price you can get for those live kilos, you can get an idea, you know, of, 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 the, uh, of the extra income we can be getting from quite cheap grass, to be honest. Um, and it's allowed us to expand our business up um, and, and take on more land. And I think that's one of the things, chatting to somebody last night, was saying that, you know, someone was talking to a neighbour and they were thinking look, how they weren't, feel, they weren't profitable, the dairy, dairy situation, what can we do? to get more profitable, it was to, oh, we're going to get more cows, that's how we're going to get more profitable. And I think that's a common thing in the industry when we're very much production focused. But when we started making a profit margin per cow, it suddenly becomes, you're a lot more confident of taking on that extra farm and expanding your operation where you know that what you're doing at the moment is making a profit. And in terms of the stocking rate, um, we're still catching up with the new land we, talk, uh, we took on in terms of, of increasing our herd and getting that stocking rate up there but I think we can get to on an organic system about 1.8 acres or potentially on good good land maybe 1.6 acres um, per cow equivalent on the farm and I think if we can get up to those those are kind of if you go with by the AHDB figures those are kind of national average in the UK for stocking rates for beef suckler systems so if we're in a conventional stocking rate and we're producing the same amount of cattle and the same amount of food, and we've got business performance that backs it up, but also we've got all of those environmental benefits that we've seen there as well, it becomes a no-brainer. And I think this is actually why this kind of system and these kinds of systems are just taking over, and there's so much interest out there. It's incredible to see how, how much land in the UK now is being managed in this way, and it just it's almost seems like it's exponential. Um, but we moved on from, from the finishing stock. We were in a situation where initially I wanted to go into pedigree suckler, suckler herd, but the bank would only support buying store cattle and selling them because we turned over that, that, um, that capital every 12 months. And so they knew they were going to get at least some of their money back. And they didn't like the idea of, of, a, of a loan to pay for cows. Um, we had a really good, a couple of years ago, the organic prices were at about 4.95 a kilo dead. And uh, we sold 60 fat cattle. Um, and then I went and bought a pedigree suckler herd and then phoned the bank to tell them. And uh, l luckily, they were quite understanding. Uh, <laughs> but one of the reasons for doing that is, is part of the, uh, the holistic management thing. Was, as I could see that even with the good organic prices we were getting at that time, all it would take was a price shift to move things in a different direction. So those figures there are based on on uh, the suckler performance that we were on. 
uh, just selling, you know, selling into the market, or sorry, the finished cattle selling, in, selling at market prices. And one of the things with holistic management is, is it encourages you not just to look at your costs, because we're very good at saying, well, this is how many cattle we've got, and this is how much the price is likely to be, so this is how much money we're going to make. And then what we'll do is we'll look at our costs, and then we'll try and reduce our costs accordingly, and hope, hopefully there's a, there's a gap between the two. And I think one of the really good things about holistic management, a lot of the financial planning stuff within it is actually the same stuff we all did at Agricultural College. There's not a lot that's new in there. But one of the key things is the focus that you have is just a change of mindset. So one of the training days that I went on quite early on was looking at your revenue and then pl trying to plan for a 50% profit. And when we first heard that, we just thought, that's absolutely crazy. You're not gonna, you can't do anything with that. But just that mindset of planning for a 50% rate of profit on that turnover then forced you to get to a position where 25, 30% didn't seem crazy, didn't, and it forced you to look at things you perhaps wouldn't have looked at. And I think that mindset change where you actually plan your profit first and have that almost as a cost in the business, as, as one of your first costs was a big thing, because we tend to be price takers and quite often we're cost takers as well. We just assume the same things or the same costs like overwintering costs, for example. So we went into the, the pedigree side because we wanted to increase our margins. And I was doing a few talks, and, uh, and Dad was telling me, you're spending this time off the farm. It's not benefiting the farm. What on earth are you doing? You need to do something that's going to pay. How is it helping us? And I thought, well, well if we've got something to sell, then, then that'll, you know, just being completely honest, that's, our, that's, our, that's how, what we were looking at, is something that we can add value. And if we believe in the product, then it's going to give us something to... Something to uh, something that people can look at. Those are two half-brothers. Those are native Angus. So talk a little bit about the Angus and the, and the grass genetics. And one of the interesting things, I think, is with all the, all the uh, progress we've made with genetics in, in Europe and North America and this focus on growth, we've actually lost a few things as well. So we've lost a focus on structure. And that's one of the things sort of inherited down in Grandad bred her pedigree Herefords for a long time and they're absolute sticklers for structure. So foot structure, leg structure, um, you know, how the animals stand, you know, your, your shoulder slope, position of the thurl, you know, slope from hook to pin, all of that stuff that is, that, so when we, when we started out and we bought the herd, you know, I was very lucky in having that support at home to give us that. But one of the things you see with the high growth rates is it, it, has, it has impacts. You know, if you look at these animals, you can see that they're gonna grade you know, these are good, but this is 60, this is, these are genetics from the 1960s. And I'm not sure we've come very far in terms of, in terms of what we've done with genetics because we're creating problems and open cows and, and lack of fertility. And I think looking at EBVs and the figures, first of all, is obviously there's an element of human nature in estimated breeding values in that it's human beings that are putting the figures in. Um, they are important and they can be really valuable, but... I think one of the things that they can often be is every bull sale you'll see in the top 5% for growth rate or in the top 1% for growth rate, these are the key things. Well, and that's, if you look at the size, if you look at the EBVs for cow size, mature cow weight, they're just going up and up and up really quite fast. You know, for, you know the average, you know, you're looking at the, a figure of plus 78 for mature cow weight a few years ago and now a lot of the top cattle are there sort of plus 120 and, and more. And the thing is, how big is big enough? You know, we've already got a situation where the processes are, are not taking carcasses over 400 or not paying it over 400 kilos. Um, so we don't necessarily want endless growth and we don't want an animal that keeps growing until it's four years old, uh, especially if it needs grain in order to feed the energy requirement that that growth rate, growth rate has. Um, I think the other thing is, is, is you've got to be really careful. You can look at a graph and it can look really good, but some of the traits, if you look, for example, at people have, have you know, just looked at carving ease direct. So do, is their car, do they carve easy yet? Yeah, we'll look at carving ease direct again and again. But what that's actually done over time, because you've got to be kept really careful what you select for, is it's actually narrowed. So you, you're selecting for narrower calves that are coming out easily. And so narrower calves end up having narrower hips, so they actually don't carve as easy themselves. So by selecting for carving, for things that carve easily, you're actually selecting for things that don't carve easily. 
And so you've just got to be really careful. So, you know, there are other, other traits you can use carving his daughters, which is to look at how easily the daughters of bulls have carved. And these, these predictors, the, the most useful thing about them is, is that they offer you a chance to select on the figures before you've had to wait for that animal to mature and be four or five years in production so that you know how it's going to perform. But what we must always do is use that real data to, to validate what's going on with the figures. And I feel sometimes in the industry we don't because it's such a good marketing tool. People just chase the numbers and, and lose sight of some really important things. Um, the other things, talking about growth rate earlier, antagonistic traits. So there's a real push at the industry at the moment around maternal. And certainly in the UK, you, you look at the maternal indexes, but they, they include quite a lot on growth rate. But one of the difficulties is when you have a high growth rate. Why does an animal that's fed the same grow more than another animal? It could be feed efficiency, but a lot of it is to do with hormone balance. So the growth hormones are causing that animal to keep growing. So those growth hormones will dominate the sex hormones. And then once the sex hormones come up and dominate the growth hormones, the growth plates on the end of the long bones close, they stop growing, and the secondary sexual characteristics then start coming in on that animal. So that early sexual maturity coming in is also important for our grass-fed systems where you know, some of our native breeds, sometimes they won't properly mature until they're three or four year old. But that means you've got a real long turnover in terms of trying to fatten those animals off grass. So by selecting for earlier sexual, reasonable growth rate, but then earlier sexual maturity, that allows that animal to stop growing and finish at the right age. Um, but this selection that we've had over the years, and some of the Angus cows, I mean, it's a very broad genetic base within Angus, but some of the Angus cows, the frame size on them is huge. You're talking about 1,000 kilo cows. Um, and whilst that might be good when you sell a cull cow, it's not good when you've got to maintain it over the winter. Um, and with all the improvements in the US in terms of these so-called growth EBVs, the weaning weight of calves over the last 15 years has, is, an, is a complete flat line in the US, despite all these EBVs with growth rates. But the cow weights has gone up like this. So you've got heavier cows producing a, a smaller percentage of their body weight in a calf by selecting for those growth rates. And there's actually some evidence as well to show that even if you select for, that growth, for the weaning weight as a percentage of the dam weight, that also is, is an antagonistic trait to trying to select for, that, um, for those weaning weights. It doesn't really have an impact. So I think for me, it's all about balance. And probably most people have got good cows in their herd already. As someone who sells breeding stock, I shouldn't probably say that. But the reality is there's good cows there that produce a calf every year that have got fertility. Something else we've got at the moment is marbling. Everyone's going after marbling for, for eating quality. But again, if you've got a hormonally balanced bull that's fertile, then they're going to be higher in testosterone, which means that they're going to have a lower fat content in their muscle. So when we start selecting for higher intramuscular fat, we're again starting to mess with hormone balance. And, and it, one of the things we've just got to be really careful, and I think you know, there's a, an American breeder who I, I chat to on the internet now and again, he's, he's very good, and he always comes out of this line when you know, anyone comes with something that they want to do with cattle, and just be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. And um, I think the other thing as well is, is the use of epigenetics. So we want to make sure that we want genetic progress, but that's also related to our environment. So epigenetics is how the genome of an animal through generations can change purely because of its interaction with the environment. So environmental factors that can change which genes are turned on and express themselves in the phenotype and the production of that animal. Um, and so that's really important. So if you've got cattle that, if you're buying cattle from a showman who's, who's got ad lib grain and you're buying your females or your bulls from that and then you're keeping females, you know, that, that animal has gone through generations and generations of never having gone without. And so, you know, but going to your neighbor or finding a local producer who hasn't got, who's not feeding, who's grass fed, who, you know, doesn't, you know, the cows should work for you, you shouldn't work for the cows. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good saying you hear in the States a lot. So you just want to make sure you've got cows that are working for a living 
and they're passing on that productivity and that hardiness into the next generations. Uh, this is a bull we've used on AI, but just to show you, you can see all the negative, for basically for all the growth rates, the green ones are all negative, but they're high, he's high in calving ease. Um, you can see his lot is higher in uh, scrotal circumference, but his carcass uh, and meat retail numbers are higher. So this is a bull that the mature cow weight plus 60 would be th seen as, as too small. Um, and because of the carcass weights would be seen as something you wouldn't want in terms of you know, what it's going to do to your cattle. Uh, that's the bull as an Angus. And I think he's, he's a, really good, it's a really good example of, you know, you've got a, a well-muscled bull, but he's really masculine as well. You see a lot of these high-growth bulls and they look steery because they don't have that testosterone to create the, you can see the thoracic extension around his withers. Um, that's created from that testosterone, those secondary sexual characteristics, the crest he's got on his neck, um, real masculine animal. And then one of the things that we can get wrong, you know, it's something I've discovered and, and a good discussion with dad is, is selecting that meat animal. You know, you've got that eye in the market, you want that nice rump and you're looking for that square animal. And if you select your females based on that, you're actually selecting away from uh, hormone balance in your females. So, so this is a cow, it's probably my favorite cow at home, and she wouldn't have been in the past, um, but a feminine female brings a masculine male. You know, she, she's got a perfect udder, she's absolutely correct on her legs and feet. You've got a nice slope from hook to pin, which is an indication of calving ease. And in terms of the hormone, looking for the hormone balance in the phenotype when you're selecting your cows, something we've found is just by selecting for fertility, so culling out cows that don't perform, they're always the more masculine looking cows, the ones that perhaps have got a little bit of a crest when they're in good condition, which they shouldn't really have. You're looking for that feminine neck, and there's a, there's a, there's a cattle scientist called Jan Bonsma um, from South Africa, who's probably who's recognized as one of the top cattle scientists um, there's, a, there's been. And he analyzed the structure of of the skeletons of about 40,000 cattle on various ranches on, on his own university ranch in South Africa. And th these are some of the points that he raised about functionally fertile females. But you can see that, that shoulder, the prominent shoulder, which means that there's not that thoracic, thoracic extension on the top of the spine where you see the, uh, the bone spurs on the top of the spine grow up to give that top line. So something we often do in the show ring is we're looking for a perfect top line flat top line, but actually you're selecting for imbalance in the hormone when you look at that phenotype if you're not careful. Um, and so, you know, a lovely cow, she holds, holds condition really well, she milks really well, and she's fertile, she's in calf every year. So uh, that's a different cow, but similar principle, she's a slightly smaller one, and that was, um, was probably a month before weaning. So in terms of weaning weight as a percentage of body weight, and, uh, you know, in a feminine cow producing a masculine calf, um, you know, proof is in the pudding. So in terms of cow size as well, we talked a little bit about that. Um, the reality is that you can keep more cows compared to, you know, keep more small cows compared to big cows. So we try and have, rather than these huge, great big 900 kilo cows that are all the rage, is we come down to about 650 kilos um, you, you know, they'll be a bit less than that when they're in their working clothes, but um, pre-bulling, when they're sort of gaining condition back, um, and pre-carving, actually, they'll be, you know, they'll be, they'll be up around 650. So um, you can look at the figures there that the difference in terms of the number of calves is huge when we look at that. You know, and the extra money we get from the extra calves is, is a really difficult thing to get from the extra weight of calves from a growth rate. So if you're gonna go and get a high EBV bull for growth to get heavier calves, um, the reality is in order to get that, you're probably gonna to have to feed um, that extra fertility into the cows with the bigger cows. Um, so it's about not having maximum growth, it's about having optimal growth. Um, not having extreme frame size, again, just aiming for the optimum. And in terms of what we're looking for is a live calf. So we aim for our smallest heifers to finish at about 275 kilos dead weight, so we're avoiding penalties on the grid. And if the heifers do that, 
for our customers, then we know the steers will make those weights. And as long as they're getting an O plus or better, and they're not getting penalised, then that's what we want. We don't want to go more extreme. It's the number of live calves that's the, that, that is the real profit driver. Fertility is the number one prof profit driver for that. So what is it, two minutes? Okay. So we've talked about this. Important functional traits are probably more important than growth rate. So just go moderate on growth rate. Go moderate on, on carcass. Your feet and legs, you know, the hair coat in the winter... The udder is absolutely important. No one wants to be stripping udders. Um, they should go straight away if you have any problems. And, um, you know, and, and make sure you've got that fertility every year. They should bring a, a live calf every year. I think that's all I've got for now. But thank you very much.